much, Rio. I appreciate you and Matthew getting me started. And uh, big thanks to NAMZ for allowing me to present for you all today. Um, my name is Paula Johnson. I'm the Director of Education at Princeton Rescue Squad. Uh, we offer a variety of courses here, and I've been instructing classes for over the last 20 years. Uh, and over that time, I've had great encounters with students, and I've had wonderful encounters, and then you have some of those that are the mediocre encounters, and I think we can all kind of relate to that. At some point in time, if you're taught long enough, you run into issues. So it's always important to try to figure out how to establish and maintain a culture that really brings in the open inquiry into the classroom and allows these students to be able to interact in professional ways. So I'd like to go ahead and kind of share with you uh, what I have for presentation. I'm going to stop my personal video so I can get a clear picture of my screen. And I'm going to assume that you all can still see it unless Rio kind of jumps in and tells me that you can't. But we're good. All right. So when we all started teaching, you know, we thought that our class was going to look kind of like this. You know, you've got happy people that seem like they're engaged. They're trying to grow professionally. And one of the best ways to try to do that, to get them to grow, is to uh, include critical thinking skills and metacognition. And that kind of allows our students to engage in discussion and debate subjects. It's the best way to do that. But people don't always see eye to eye, and not everybody will agree. And all it takes is one unthoughtful comment made and someone taking offense to that. And the next thing you know, factions have formed, fights are breaking out, and it's really important that you be able to navigate the human aspect as an educator. And remember that if the students can find the fissure, they could potentially tear down the entire establishment. And next thing you know, the inmates are running the prison. And the whole time you're left sitting there thinking, this is going to be the longest cohort ever. And this, this actually happened to me. I had, I had a class, it happened many years ago, uh, one small statement was made by a student and another one took offense. And then all of a sudden this just blew up. Uh, the student that took offense had close ties with management. I was working at a different company then. Um, and the next thing I know, the manager was at my doorstep and he was just outside my classroom. He starts yelling and he's screaming and he's so angry over this other student and how that statement was taken out of context. And he 100% took the offended student's side without wanting to hear both sides of the story. So that was all it took. Um, the students overheard that, obviously. The control was ripped away from me. And I've got to tell you, that was the worst experience of my life. It really was like the inmates were running the prison. We had, they would start to cultivate into little factions and you'd have this person over here backbiting this person over there and they couldn't work together because they would yell at each other and it was just a constant constant battle but <clears throat> hopefully by the end of today you know I will give you some ideas on what the three untruths are that are faced by young people in the United States and the potential impact that this can actually have on our classroom on our adult classroom will describe what the theory of open inquiry is and appreciate the value of it in our EMS classroom. Hopefully I'll be able to give you some ways to approach and cultivate that community of open inquiry and discuss methods that can reduce that incident of cognitive distortions and hopefully improve mindfulness in the meantime. <clears throat> so just to give you a little bit of a background and incidentally, let me bring this up too. At the end of this presentation, I actually have included a link for you all um, where you can pull my lesson plan, the presentations and the handouts that I use actually in my paramedic program that can help foster or develop this uh, open inquiry. So if you have an interest in it, you're more than welcome to take that and develop it as your own and, and, and make it however you like. But now for me, what got me started again with this incident with this classroom, I really wanted to understand how we got where we are today. And I developed an entire presentation that explores this at depth. And I can't give it to you all today because it's far longer than an hour. So what I wanted to do is just kind of give you a big rundown 
of where I found my information and the important highlights and how we can kind of help navigate these problems and kind of give you some direction on what you can do. So if there was a book that I could recommend you uh, look at or research, it would be The Coddling of the American Mind. This is written by Greg Lukanoff and Jonathan Haidt. Their text is well referenced. They do an excellent job of identifying what makes today's students tick and why they respond the way they do. And what they found in their research was that there were three truths that was faced by every American student today. The first untruth is what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. The second is you should always, always trust your feelings. And the third, life is a battle between good and evil people. <laughs> now, if you're like me, the first time I read that in the book when I was reading the narrative, I thought, okay, I'm really confused because that's not at all the way I was brought up to know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is what it should be, right? Um, but I think we can all agree that this really should be listed as the three untruths. These are the things that they're being impacted with that unfortunately for some of us, uh, when we get these students into the classroom, we have to navigate. So the first untruth, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the reality of it is that we're anti-fragile. Nason Nicholas Taleb, he's the professor of risk engineering at NYU. He feels that we, most of us think about risk in the wrong way. We're not China, we're not fragile and have to be handled with care. Instead, we are actually anti-fragile and we require regular physical and mental challenges and stressors or we will actually deteriorate. We all know, all of us know we're in EMS, what happens to muscles if you fractured your arm and you've been in a cast for several months. By the time you come out, the muscles have atrophied and have grown weaker as the result of not being challenged. So we should be focusing our attention on trying to help those students to become or develop their innate, innate abilities from their experiences. They want them to grow and learn, and we want them to be resilient. Now, this is a picture of a gentleman that was participating in the Spartan race at the Summit Bechtel Reserve in West Virginia back in 2017. It was pre-COVID-19 pre days. Um, but I have no idea what his life experiences were, but if, you've ever, if you know anything about that Spartan race, it is the most insane race. Google it sometime. It's pretty crazy. Uh, but to see him being willing to not give up, um, to not become weak and helpless is something that I think we need to remember and try to instill in our students. If a child growing up is not allowed to experience risks and stressors, which we all know are natural, they're unavoidable parts of life, they could actually be set up to be incapable to adapt as adults. So for our EMS students, when we get those individuals into our class, they're the ones that we usually have to remind them that working in this field is gonna always keep them working on the edge or right outside their comfort zone. So they have to be prepared to be courageous and do that. And Van Jones uh, was doing a speaking engagement at the University of Chicago. And I've shared the YouTube link for his um, for his presentation on here. But he came up with a statement. His primary purpose was summed up in this one quote. He said, I want you to be strong. I'm not gonna pave the jungle for you. You need to put on some boots. And I think that's really important. Sometimes we get individuals in class that are so terrified, they have so much anxiety and they've kind of fed into these anxieties that they believe they cannot do anything and they expect other people to help them and pave that jungle so that they don't have to deal with any, any aspect of, of anxiety or anything. So I think this is just kind of a good summary. I really enjoyed his little speech. It wasn't very long at all, um, but I thought it was pretty good. The second untruth is that you should always trust your feelings. And <laughs> It's important to realize 
that feelings may be compelling, but they're not always reliable. They can distort our reality. They can deprive us of insight and needlessly damage our relationships. So I have listed the nine most common cognitive distortions that uh, were identified in Leahy, Holland, and McGinn's book, um, Treatment Plans and Interventions for Depression and Anxiety Disorders. And I thought we could kind of go through these and look at them. And I'm sure that many of you could probably, you know, come up with these little phrases in your mind that you've heard some of your students say over the past. But let me, let me show you a few here. So we have first emotional reasoning. I feel anxious, therefore I know I'm going to feel, fail this skill station. I know it's just not going to happen, or I'm going to go to National Register and go fail those psychomotor exam. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm just, I'm terrified. I'm never going to, I'm never going to pass. Catastrophizing. And <laughs> this is probably a very common one. Uh, it would be terrible if I failed the National Registry. I would just die. We've always heard people say, I'll just die if I fail or catastrophizing in that case. Another cognitive distortion is overgeneralization. It's, this always happens to me. I seem to fail at a lot of things. And dichotomous thinking. This is our all or none thinking. And it was a complete waste of time. Like I shouldn't have even bothered taking this class. It was a complete waste of time. So they got nothing out of it. They absolutely got nothing. Mind reading. You know, that preceptor hates me. He thinks I'm a loser. Labeling. I like this one because I, I personally have said this and I know that I've heard other people say this, but it always starts out with the labeling where he says, I'm, he is a complete idiot. And then usually it's followed by, if he can pass the national registry, then so can I. So we're kind of, we're labeling someone in a very negative manner when we do that. And it's actually a very common cognitive distortion. Negative filtering, look at all these people who don't like me. Discounting positives. You know, those skill labs were so easy. I, I don't, thanks for telling me, but they really don't count because they're just so simple. Um, you know, so they don't matter. It's discounting the positives when you should give yourself credit for what you've accomplished. And then finally, nine is blaming. And this was one I thought of. Um, I missed that innovation because my partner didn't give me enough crack pressure. It's always blaming someone else. That's a cognitive distortion. <clears throat> so again, John was the co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind. And in his book, he references the brain as two very specific parts. He talks about the elephant, which is considered that uncontrolled, unconscious, intuitive part of the brain. And then you also have the rider. And the rider is the conscious controlled, language-based thinking part of the brain. And the writer often believes he's in control, but the elephant, the elephant is vastly stronger and he's gonna to tend to win in any conflict that arises. And as a rule, the, the writer generally functions like the elephant's servant more than its master. And what I mean, excuse me, what I mean is that the writer is extremely skilled at producing justifications for whatever the elephant does or believes. So I've got an example on here for you. Elephant says, crocodiles, we're not safe. We need to, we need to go out and get out of the river. We need to get out. And the writer just says, okay, and starts screaming, um, which I'm not going to scream today, but there you go. But emotional reason, reasoning is considered a cognitive distortion. The writer does have some ability to talk back and if they can reframe the situation so that the elephant can actually see it in a new way, then they may be motivated to move in a new direction. So if the writer acts more like a lawyer who's able to rationalize and justify the elephant's conclusions, and here's the example, have we really ever been attacked here? And the elephant says no. And the writer again says, Besides, we're in Mongolia. They don't have crocodiles. So in this case, this is our basis for cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's something we can easily deploy in our programs. It's something that we probably already use. We just never gave it a label. Um, and I think it's important to remember, too, as we're talking about these, these distortions, these cognitive distortions, and how to combat those, 
it's not just limited to our students. It's something that we as instructors also have to deal with on a constant basis. We have the same weaknesses as our students do. We can fall prey to these as well. So we have to take a good look at ourselves and make sure that we're navigating this, these waters just as well for ourselves as we do for our students. So the untruth, number three, is that life is a battle between good and evil people. But unfortunately, reality is always more complicated than the narrative. And if someone chooses to construct a narrative about what is wrong or who is to blame or how to make things right, then sometimes people become demonized unfairly. And this is something that we see a lot right now uh, with the politics and stuff going on and so we have to ask ourselves a question, you know, should we be teaching solidarity in our EMS classes or should we try to embrace diversity? And in medic class, I always use, and I hate it because it seems like I use it far more often than I really want to, but I always say it depends. Um, and I think this is one of those cases. Solidarity is great for working in unison if you're trying to get a job done, but, are, but there are situations where you want to try to develop critical thinking skills. And that's when you really need the diversity to kind of help drive uh, the critical thinking that you're looking for your students to develop. And this is how open inquiry kind of helps enhance these critical thinking skills. Open inquiry is considered a student-centered approach to learning. The students would be able to have the freedom to ask questions without fear of reprisal. And the goal is that they can debate topics in a healthy way. But in order for open inquiry to work, we have to accept the fact that we are flawed thinkers. We have a strong preference for believing that our ideas are right. And that's, that, that can actually lead to confirmation bias. We're gonna, we, we have the tendency, we will actually vigorously search for evidence that confirms what we already believe. And if we don't have that diverse thinking, we don't have those people there to kind of question what's going on, then people, groups, individuals will congregate around methods or ideas that are considered, that are generally confirmed that shared narrative, and they will ignore everything else that doesn't support their original narrative. But we have to practice intellectual humility. We have to admit when we are mistaken and be gracious to those who gave us a new perspective. And I think that's something that some, you know, gets lost in there is we, we need that diversity and we need to, to relish and embrace it and be happy about it. Because if we don't, we'll be stuck in the same hole every day. But if we do ask our students to engage in discussion or topics that we have to be prepared uh, we need to be prepared to help navigate or deploy some sort of method to try to circumvent or prevent conflict that could potentially escalate in an unhealthy way. So this is really where, you know, we have to try to navigate these waters should that somehow arise at some point in our program. And <clears throat> all it really takes is just one student making a comment or calling out a slight offense, and that's known as a microaggression. And it can actually trigger what's referred to as the call-out culture. And this is where students will gain prestige for identifying these small offenses and then calling it out, uh, calling out the offender to others in the classroom. And we really, if we're not vigilant as instructors, this can actually cause our program to fail because the students will become fearful of speaking up or engaging in discussion. And if that happens, you can actually lose that unity and solidarity and the trust that's necessary for success. So there are things that we can do to correct or prevent microaggressions. And we can always look at some sort of pre-training program. And that's what I, here in a few minutes, I'm gonna show you uh, the pre-training. I'm just gonna give you an overview of it and then you guys can look at it if, if you want, you can look at it in that link. But the pre-training, you're looking to try to teach students how to be polite and avoid giving accidental or thoughtless offenses. Most people don't even realize they do it. And then also teaching students to give the benefit of the doubt, 
to interpret actions in a way that elicits the least amount of emotional reactivity. Uh, you want to try to promote a principle of charity. And this is uh, one of the phrases that they use in, in the uh, coddling of the American Mind book is, I'm guessing you didn't mean any harm when you said that, but you need to know that some people may interpret this to mean blah, 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 whatever it could be. Um, that is a good way to kind of, you know, giving benefit of the doubt and saying, hey, you said something that may be offensive to someone else, and this is why. And it's also important to remember when we start talking about that, you know, battle of good versus evil is to make sure that everyone knows that a simple faux pas saying that wrong little oopsie does not necessarily make you an evil person or an aggressor. And what I found you know, over the last few years is that sometimes it's necessary when you're communicating with these students one-on-one, -on -one, if you're having that, that follow-up conversation, if they came to you about an issue, um, and, and there's, there's, if you can bring it into it, is to remind them that, you know, you're going to be, no matter how good you think you are as a human being and how right you think you always are, you're going to be the evil guy, the bad guy in someone else's narrative. So that that really cuts us at the heart of who we are. We're, we're constantly weighing this out, instructors and students alike. And I think it's really important to remember that the faux pas does not make someone straight out evil or we're not going to talk to them anymore because they're just wrong, uh, just because they don't agree with us. Now, as EMS educators, we should be focused on the development or reinforcement of those positive character traits that we want, our want in our students and try to reinforce a sense of community that best represents our mission in emergency medical services. And for me, what I did uh, developed this cohesion. I, to develop this cohesion, I began on the very first day of class. And my goal is to kind of give you some ideas here on what I've done, kind of display a little bit of how I, I built this into the program. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to gather something that you can use in your classroom. So we're gonna talk about um, Martin Luther King here for a second. Dr. Martin Luther King, he was phenomenal for using humanity uh, to appeal to the, to the masses. He would appeal to the shared morals and identities of Americans, and he strove to humanize his opponents by appealing to their humanity. And what I've done is on the very first day of class, I try to instill this into the students, and I do this through a couple methods. So the first thing that I do right off the bat I go ahead and I flip those introductory lessons into an online format. Like I'll lecture the intro to EMS lecture, put it online, give them the embedded questions, have them do that. And I do that specifically so that I can free up that classroom session so I can set the pace for what I'm looking for in the student's behavior from day one. And I kind of build this unity by doing the class introductions. Now I use the toilet paper game. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. There's a thousand of options out there. With the toilet paper game, you essentially get out the roll of toilet paper, you tell each student pass it around, take however much toilet paper off you would use when you go to the restroom, and then for each square, that's one uh, personal information point that they have to provide to their classmates. So they're kind of giving their personal details, and, and I always lead that. So I'll take off toilet paper, and then I'll go through and I'll tell them what I'm looking for. So I'll be like, no, uh, you know, I've been married for blah, 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 and I've got children and all this, you know, so that's kind of how we're looking at that. The goal with the toilet paper game is that we are finding at least one point that is personal to that individual, and then another point that explains why they want to be in class. And I won't let them use the easy out. If they try to give an easy out, I tell them, nope, you got to give me something better. Um, so that whole I want to help people phrase that everybody likes to use, I don't, I will not allow that. They have to give me something tangible. 
And then after we're done, because this can take a good bit if you do it right, um, we do a follow-up question. And I ask the students to identify a common theme or a thread that appeared throughout the presentation or, or through, through everyone's introductions, excuse me. And then we kind of flow into how uh, these guys get together and work together as a team. And, you know, I'm opening the door to humanize their fellow classmates. That's the goal is to try to give them some sort of thread that says, hey, you know, they have this and, and it's same to what I have, you know, they have kids and they're in this class too and they're, they're working 24 hour shifts or whatever it may be. And, you know, they're having to do everything that I'm doing. So we're trying to humanize their fellow classmates so they can kind of get that connection, that human connection between them. Next, I like to do a group challenge. It gets them up on their feet. I use the floating stick game. This is another one. I don't know if you've seen it, but you break the class into small teams, usually somewhere between five to seven people, and we give them a broomstick. And the, the goal is they have to get the broomstick to the ground, but everyone in the group has to be touching the stick. They can only touch it with the tops of their fingers, their pointer fingers. They can't use any other part of their body to get that stick to the ground and they have to lower it as a team and no one can lose contact with the stick. They have to hold it. Um, it's really fun to, to, to watch the students try to make this happen, but the goal as the educator is it gives you a chance to see what personalities you have and some insights into potential issues or conflicts that you can actually encounter moving forward. And then to move right into the next, the actual presentation that I do with the students is I ask them to tell me what they thought their greatest challenge was to getting, to, to getting the stick to the floor and what they ultimately had to do to make it succeed. And once we've kind of worked through that, then I do the presentation. And the presentation on, for me, I do characteristics of successful teams. And in 1948, Bean and Sheets came out with the functional roles of group members. So this kind of talks about the three common roles that can be seen among members of a group. And then after the presentation, I ask them to, again, break into their teams and we talk about what those behaviors are. So. I give out poster board, they break into three groups, poster board with each group. I provide them, uh, you know, what their assigned role is. And then I ask them to give me examples of an EMS classroom behavior that represents the role that they were assigned on that poster board. So they'll write their examples on the poster board that reflect that role, that group member role. And then when they're done, I don't just say, okay, we're done. I actually make them rotate through everybody's uh, poster board. And I use different color markers for this. So when they rotate through, I'm like, okay, if you see any more examples that you think need to be added, go ahead and add them on there. So then I can see if the groups are actually participating or if they're just reading and moving on. So I try to press them to, to come up with at least one. And then afterwards, we review the results as a class and then I, I ask students, is there anyone that can provide an example of a time when they worked on a team project and maybe it wasn't very successful and what those blocks to success were? And that kind of helps guide us and, and solidifies what I'm looking for with them as a team. And usually you can find that there's some communication skills that are really necessary and they, they will bring this up in that group project. So at that point, we start talking about the communication skills for the program, how we want them to, to respect and value each other. You know, if there's a question or someone raises a question that they can clarify, persuade and defend, uh, but it's all about building the team characteristics that we're looking for in their communication skills and making sure that they understand how to reject cognitive distortions and how to practice that principle of charity. So, you know, it's, 
It's all about remembering. And, and I do go over those no, nine cognitive distortions we, we talked about. And I said, these are some ways that you, you may accidentally fall into the pit. And I think to kind of help you as the instructor um, ingrain yourself with the students, it's important to remind them as well that you could easily fall into that trap yourself and that they should, they should be able to interact with you in the same manner. <coughs> Excuse me. So finally, at the end of the, 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 the product, when we get here, we talk about the code of ethics for the classroom. And I did adopt the I Care Code of Ethics that Chris Levador put out so long ago, integrity, compassion, accountability, respect, and empathy. And I asked the students to define what each of those words mean to them. And I actually keep this and it gives me a baseline to, uh, to uh, provide their affective accountability. So if I have someone that's not behaving in a manner that they should, I can call upon those definitions and say, but you told me this is what you believe integrity to mean. So how does this current behavior impact the, the definition you provided for integrity. So it kind of gives them a, a check and balance system. And then I really solidify that at the end by providing a professional behavior agreement that they have to sign. And in that professional behavior agreement, which I've included, uh, again, it's in with the link that I provided. Um, you know, I provide the, the statement that as a school, we are, we are going to allow them to debate in a healthy way, but we're not going to allow them to be nasty and mean to each other. They're gonna to have to maintain their boundaries on, on you know, this back and forth discussion and debate and debate healthy and not in a toxic manner. And then I actually asked them to sign each of those. And, and like I said, I did provide this so you can take a look at it um, if you're interested. I wish that it was that simple and the rest of the year would be nothing but rainbows and unicorns. Um, but unfortunately, you do have to keep up your guard because there's gonna be some moment when someone makes a faux pas or maybe they just straight out default to the emotional reasoning and you have to be able to navigate that as the instructor. And don't forget, you also can fall prey to that emotional reasoning um, I, I catch myself, matter of fact, last week I caught myself and I'm like, oh, you know, I really shouldn't have responded to that student that way. That was not, that was not very good. Um, and so then I had to go back and kind of sit down with that individual and talk to them. But we can prepare the students for controversy. We want to hold each other accountable for providing any evidence to a substantiated an assertion. So making well-reasoned arguments well-reasoned arguments. And I think sometimes uh, we get a little bit lost in that. Um, it's, it's easy to fall into it. Uh, well, that's because we've always done it that way. Um, that's not a well-reasoned argument. We need to say, okay, well, let's look at the pros and cons of what this offers. Is this a possible option that we can look at for the future? And that kind of falls into, we want to make sure we're avoiding criticizing people, we want to avoid that rather than the idea or the premise. And we can prepare students uh, by, by doing so. You can gently correct distortions that interfere with the task at hand. You can ask a series of questions that encourages our students to ground their assertions in some sort of textual evidence and consider any alternative interpretations that are out there. And you know, things like some phrases, here are some examples, you're unprofessional, or you're behaving unprofessionally, or you're just wrong. <laughs> Sometimes we'll just say, no, you're wrong. And telling them they're unethical. Actually, when you make those comments, these are those slights, those little bit of microaggressions we were talking about earlier. When you say things like that, you can actually shift that other person's focus from whatever that issue is at hand, suddenly they're going to go into defense mode because what you've done is you've attacked their character. And they're not, <laughs> the, suddenly the focus of the whole argument and the whole debate is lost. And rather, maybe it would be better to say, you know, 
when you do blah, whatever it would be, it, it is undermining the focus of the learning. This is what we need to look at. Uh, that's a good way to kind of navigate that or blaming others for uh, your feelings. You know, you really make me angry when you, in, when you interrupt me. You just, you, you really just make me so angry. I can't even talk to you anymore. You, you, you just make me mad. And if you do that, instead of the person apologizing, most people will straight up divert to defend themselves instead of trying to, to, to ask, instead of trying to, to, to try to, uh, what's the word I'm like? Well, I mean, they're just, they don't apologize. They don't want to apologize. Suddenly you've made a personal attack upon them and, and they're not going to tolerate that. So it can like, you lose the whole focus of your entire argument. Instead, maybe say, can you please just let me finish? or you know, reroute them, just don't focus on them or your personal emotions because that just brings that whole cognitive distortion into the, into the picture. And that's kind of where we're talking about using that cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy to rationalize the statements. And that's where we want to uh, remember when you're communicating, you should, you know, maybe you should do blah, you know, if you say maybe you should do, maybe you should look at, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a, maybe you should tape, put the tape down after you've already attached the IV site. Why, why do you do that before you don't even, they're bleeding out on the table. Um, when you do that, you can actually make that person feel marginalized or talk down to. So instead, if you used phrases like, have you thought of Blah. Have you ever thought about, you know, taking that flush and, and checking it to make sure that it's going to run right before you tape it down? Have you ever thought about that? Or what would happen if, you know, you're, you're asking them to consider and in doing so, you're actually allowing them to have more control in the communication. You're wanting them to debate and discuss and inviting their input. So it's really important. And we really want to, to foster the moral independence. We want to foster courage over caution. We want to hold students, again, we're holding them accountable for their actions. And we want to preach open communication between parties rather than external intervention. That was something else that, that happened from time to time with me with that particular class that I described at the beginning is um, suddenly it ended in these uh, big arguments or these big debates over, well, he said this and she said that. And they would come to me and ask me to be the one that, that settles the problem. And instead, we should try to preach the open communication between the parties so that they can handle those problems at their level before trying to bring in a third party to try to intervene. So I just wanted to take a minute and go back through and give you all just my final thoughts on what I've kind of put together and kind of, I'm looking forward to hearing your all's feedback or questions, but I think it's important to remember that we are all, students and instructors alike, are prone to emotional reasoning. And we need to practice techniques of cognitive behavioral therapy where we're actually stopping and we're asking ourselves, okay, this act or whatever this is, has made me think or feel a certain way, but I need to respond to it in a healthy way. So how are we gonna do that? So two apps that are highly relate, rated by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America is the CPT Coach and Anxiety Coach. And we need to learn to implement mindfulness. And I caught myself the other day, I was talking with one of the other managers um, on the EMS agency side, and they were asking me questions. And it, if it had been any other time, I might have gotten a little bit defensive over it. And I reminded myself to be mindful and to stay in the moment, to remain calm and be present and not pass judgment, not let myself have that immediate emotional response, but to actually listen to what they were telling me and be mindful and in the moment. Make sure that you give people the benefit of the doubt. We're looking at that principle of charity. And as instructors and students, we want to make sure we're modeling this during discussions and any arguments. 
I always like to give students a chance in class. If someone speaks up and says, Paula, you know, how does this work? You know, if another student in class has the answer and they, they chime in and they respond back, um, I like for them to do that. And if I see that it's starting down a path that probably isn't correct or gonna get them through the program, you know, I'll try to facilitate, facilitate and navigate that conversation so that they can build off of each other and develop that critical thinking skills that we want. And we want them to practice intellectual humility. And here's another little thing for you. Uh, Catherine Schultz actually wrote a book. It's called On Being Wrong, Working in the Margins of Error. And it's a really good book, but she also has a TED Talks video out that's a little bit shorter, gives you a, a bridge of what her book is actually about. But she's the one who talks about having people around us who are willing to disagree is considered a gift. And we need to admit when we're wrong and thank our critics for helping us to see it. Uh, so that's kind of the importance to remember that you know, we do have a bias. We, we always think we're right, right up to the very moment that we find out we're wrong. And then suddenly you ask yourself, well, how did I go so awry? But we can do that as, as students and instructors both. Now, if you work for a college, you want to try to cultivate those intellectual virtues. And there's a website you can check out called intellectualvirtues.org. But you want to cultivate their curiosity. You want them to be open-minded. And remember that, again, the school wants to try to, to focus on people being open and respectful and practicing that intellectual humility. And as instructors, we can specifically give students practice in debate, and we want to make sure that we are explicitly rejecting the fact that they're fragile. They're not fragile. We want to allow them the ability to be prepared for conflict, controversy, and argument, and just make sure that they can rationalize and provide well-reasoned arguments. And make sure that we emphasize, emphasize the power of confirmation bias and cognitive distortions and held each other accountable. So again, we're going back to talking about that emotional reasoning. That's kind of like the whole theme of this entire presentation. And Remembering just because someone doesn't agree with you doesn't make them evil. Um, we want to make sure we don't offend people, unwittingly offend or exclude people. We want to engage in those conversations and encourage politeness and empathy in a charitable frame. We want to give them the benefit of the doubt that they didn't intentionally mean the faux pas that they gave. So encourage them to resolve things informally and in private, and we want to try to foster that school spirit. And the final little blurb that we have here, you know, again, looking at those three great untruths, these are the things that um, the American teenager or the American children are having to look through is what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. We are anti-fragile. Always trust your feelings. Remember that your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts that you leave unguarded. We're all prone to that emotional reasoning and confirmation bias. And life is a battle between good and evil people, but we're all prone to dichotomous thinking. It's that all or none. And I want to thank you all so much for providing me the chance to uh, engage with you all today and uh, go through all of these, these different avenues and, and talk about how our students uh, can sometimes develop these mindsets that can be very toxic to our classroom and how we can kind of overt that or, or divert that and do it correctly from day one when we can kind of engage them in that open inquiry where we can set the standard, we can set the stage and say we want to have open inquiry in our classroom. We want to have that statement. We want students to debate, but we need to set the parameters so that they do it in a healthy manner. And thank you so much, Rio. Thank you, Paula. That was fantastic. Um, now's the time, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions or anything you want to say to Paula, uh, please feel free to um, put that in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, Um, Paula, um, Justin said, can the link be listed in the chat? Um, 
was he uh, Justin were you referring to um, the SharePoint link you can just type that in there oh yeah the uh, the SharePoint link um, do you if, if you have that on you you can go ahead and drop in the chat if not um, I'll make sure that we get that out there let me see if I can I don't, okay. know if I, can, I don't know if I can click it from here. Let me see. Nope, I'm not going to be able to because I'm still in the presentation mode. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we send that out um, uh, whenever we do the, the CEUs. So, Justin, we'll make sure we get that to you. Um, also, everyone, I'm going to put the link in the chat to register for the CEU. Um, so let me just get that in there for a second. And again, any questions or anything, please submit those. Oh, okay, no questions, but lots of compliments, Paula. <laughs> if uh, if you can see those in the Q and A in the chat, um, seems like everybody really enjoyed the content. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I've I pulled it up now. So the, my tech, my Zoom tech savvy, I just figured out how to pull it up. <laughs> Awesome. But yeah, I appreciate everyone. Um, if you have any questions whatsoever, if you, you want to email me, please feel free to. Um, I, I love talking about this stuff. Um, I have a huge presentation. Maybe I can get with Nancy and, and try to see if I can't get it submitted for a symposium in a, next year or something. Uh, but it's about a three hour long lecture that kind of goes into the background of why we got to where we are. And it's a lot of it is focused on that coddling of the American Mind textbook and just how much detail they've provided. Uh, but this, this, this process and using this open inquiry ever since we initiated it, uh, we have had great success with it. Things that would normally be student arguments are easier to kind of navigate, not only in the classroom lecture section if they start arguing or debating over a topic, but also, you know, outside of that, when we get into the simulation lab, they're able to kind of communicate their ideas. And instead of biting each other, they're actually building one on top of the other. Okay, I see how you did this, but what if we did this? Can we do this and do it better? And so that's kind of helped navigate that. And I don't see half the problems I used to. And it's a lot easier if I stay on my game to be able to navigate it early on. And then we don't have a lot of issues throughout the class. It just seems to work. Yeah, yeah, no, um, yeah, I was just waiting to see if there were any more questions. Um, I just fixed, uh, Gregory brought up that um, the link was not working to the CE registration, we're good. <laughs> so I fixed that, um, and there's no more questions, so I guess uh, we're safe to wrap it up. Okay. So, so Paula, thank you so, so much. You're welcome. And, um, thank you all for joining in, and uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.